white men just don't have that much power over me, quite frankly. <laughs> a few of you have asked me to comment on this Beyond Meat debate, specifically the talk given by Michaela Peterson. Michaela Peterson is Jordan Peterson's daughter. I believe I talked about her in one video, maybe it was the carnivore video, because she is a, a fan of the carnivore diet and at least at one time was eating almost exclusively meat, meat and salt, and maybe a couple other things. She says it cured her of various ailments and she has a whole website promoting the diet to others. I'm sure she's going to be against anything to do with veganism, anything to do with eating less meat. And then the other one people mentioned was the talk by Carol Adams. Carol Adams is a vegan vegan activist who apparently says some pretty controversial slash crazy things in this talk. I don't know. Let's check it out. I've read the motion and I believe we should move beyond all meat. So what we choose to eat has consequences far beyond the circumference of our plates. Specifically, your vote tonight expresses your allegiance to or rejection of a white supremacist patriarchal worldview. Okay, so presumably if you are against moving beyond meat, if you are against a meat-free society, you are pledging your allegiance to a white supremacist patriarchal society. So first I would ask why she believes this. Does she have any evidence that sans a patriarchal white supremacists. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard for me not to laugh. Yes, there are white supremacists in this world. Yes, there are racist people in this world. But I, I think it's pretty ridiculous to call anywhere in the West white supremacists. There are certainly elements still. There is still systemic racism. I think redlining would be one of the best examples of this, of something that was inherently racist and still goes on today and has not been fixed and it still affects black people and other minorities. But I don't think that's the same thing as saying that society on the whole is white supremacist. But regardless, I would ask her why she believes that without those things, there would not be animal exploitation. People would not eat meat. Does she really believe that if women were in charge that no one would eat meat? And if so, why? Where is her evidence for that? I don't want to take her position out of context. I assume, you know, if I were to say, well, obviously there are women today and minorities today who eat meat, how is that pledging allegiance to the white su supremacy and uh, the patriarchy? And I'm sure she would, well, I assume that she would reply, well, they are part of this as well, whether they know it or not, right? Essentially that uh, women and minorities have been brainwashed by this and that's why we uh, consume animal products and defend consuming animal products, consuming meat, which is why I would ask, okay, pretend those things aren't there why would it be different? Where is your evidence that if women were in charge, <laughs> that it would be different? I think women are pretty special, but I, I don't think we're that special. I, I think we would still be eating meat. In the sexual politics of meat, I introduced the concept of animals as absent reference. In order to be eaten, animals must disappear as living beings, that is, be killed. They then disappear conceptually, as so many forms in which we eat animals' corpses are massaged by euphemistic language, hamburger, steak, pork, bacon, etc. Even the speaker just before me talked about turkeys. He's talking about dead butchered turkeys of whom part of their bodies will be eaten. Meat eaters order leg of lamb, not a baby lamb's leg. The animals cannot possess their own body parts. Absolutely. I think there is a lot of massaging of language going going on, uh, particularly within the animal industry itself. There are certain terms they prefer to use because it doesn't sound as bad. And also when we refer to animals as it instead of he or she or they, which I still do. I think probably many vegans, most vegans still do. It's a hard thing to to give up or to realize you're doing. But you'll notice that when people want to see something as a thing instead of a, a who, they call them it. 21st century animal eating requires our complicity in a new colonialism. We know how settler colonialism worked and a race and replace system that forced indigenous people off the land. 
replacing them with cattle and white settlers. Again, I, I'm not sure what this has to do with colonialism. The, the reality is supporting a civilization with animal products requires factory farming. It requires the, the situation we're in today. You have to put animals into tiny containers, essentially. You have to value their welfare as little as possible in order to make as much meat as possible and to keep it as cheap as possible so enough people can afford it. I just don't understand what that has to do with, with white people or with colonialism. I think it removes a lot of agency from me as a woman, from minorities. It removes our agency to stand up and say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Or yes, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I mean, yes, society has a huge influence on us as individuals, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're female. And all of us have the ability to say, no, I don't care if that's normal. I don't care if eating animals is normal. I'm not going to participate. I just really don't appreciate someone attempting to remove my agency like that. You know, white men just don't have that much power over me, quite frankly. <laughs> and also, I would wonder how effective this is. I mean, she is really putting veganism in a box, I guess I would say. I mean, she's taking something that is already just not uh, appetizing, for lack of a better word, not appetizing to the mainstream. Most people do not want to go vegan already. Just talking about veganism as a no more eating or wearing animals or participating in animal in entertainment, zoos, sea world, all that stuff. That is already not something many people want to do, want to participate in, want to be. People don't want to see themselves as vegan. And then on top of that, you're adding the the kind of woke stuff, the super left stuff, the patriarchy and white supremacy and all of that. I just think you're reducing the number of people who could go vegan even further. Unfortunately, you know, we're already, we're so bad at being able to separate veganism from vegans, right? The practice from the practitioners. And so when someone like this comes up and just starts spewing this really silly, super left kind of woke stuff, it's such an easy thing for people to go, oh, see, that's what veganism is. Now, to be fair, there's a good chance that those type of people would never go vegan in the first place. So maybe it doesn't have that much influence. And I don't want to say like, oh, why? You know, this is what she believes. This is what she believes. And everyone should have the ability and the, the chance to express themselves, kind of, sometimes. The point is she's she's wrong. She has no evidence for what she's saying, and it's just very uncomfortable to listen to. But also, if you are using someone like this, like Carol Adams or whoever else, or, you know, someone, some obnoxious vegan as a, oh, this is why I'm not vegan, you're the tool. <laughs> like, you're the one who's being super ridiculous. You don't have to adopt her views to be vegan. I don't adopt her views. I've been vegan for well over a decade. There are terrific rational reasons to reduce animal product consumption that have nothing to do with colonialism or white supremacy or the patriarchy. One of the defining aspects of the colonial legacy is an ongoing white supremacist belief system and an ownership paradigm. When you own the land, you get the title to it. Entitlement and ownership are linked. All the justifications for the taking of land by white colonial authorities included the claim, well, the Indians can't prove they own the land. Hunting exists within this colonial ownership paradigm. It presumes that animals don't have title to their own lives. Okay, but indigenous people hunt. I just did two videos looking at a conversation that Earthling Ed had with someone who was defending eating meat based on indigenous people's worldview. Defending hunting and killing and eating animals because it's part of balance, it's natural, the animals can actually consent. I fail to see what that has to do with colonialism. Now you can argue that they're not seeing the animals as property, which seems to be true. It is a completely different worldview. 
but it ultimately ends the same. It ultimately ends in the death of the animal. And you could also argue that this was part of necessity and this worldview stemmed out of a place of compassion, which is what I argued in, I think, the first of those videos. Really, most people don't want to kill animals and they know on some level it's wrong. And so we create these myths, we create these ideas to make it more palatable, right? Like, yeah, I'm killing the animal, but the animal actually knows and he knows it's part of nature and that it's it's good, actually. It's okay okay and he, he actually wants me to kill him. You know, we come up with that stuff because we don't want to kill animals. We don't want to hurt animals. Point is, they're killing animals out of necessity, whereas today, obviously, most of us in the West do not need to eat animals. We do not need to participate in paying for meat and supporting animal cruelty. But again, I would ask her, where is the evidence that this is all just white colonialism? That without white colonialism, we'd all be vegan? Most people find meat very, very tasty, so I, I just find that extremely hard to believe. Now, perhaps she's saying that without this concept of property supposedly introduced by colonizers, animal exploitation never would have extended beyond hunting and the relatively minor source of nutrition it typically provided. In other words, factory farming never would have existed. But number one, again, where's the evidence for that? Number two, I find it much more likely that even without the invasion of the Americas and the indigenous genocide that followed, indigenous people would have gone on to create property rights and some form of factory farming. Again, they clearly valued meat and procreation like virtually every human culture, so it's reasonable to expect their populations to have grown and to have required some form of property protection and also animal farming to feed the growing populations. And again, you can't feed civilizations lots of meat using free-range animals. You need animals animals crammed into tiny spaces. And number three, Native American tribes were already farming before Columbus showed up. Most of them were, and they had property. Even among North American hunter-gatherer nations, societies often allocated hunting grounds to specific families. And these people didn't simply harvest nature's bounty. They used techniques like diverting streams and burning underbrush to manage the land to ensure future harvests. It's ridiculous to think eating meat wouldn't have continued without white people. It's much more reasonable to expect a long history of animal exploitation, no matter what culture predominated. If that is what she's saying, again, it's not clear. It's the new colonialism that boasts, I'll hunt for myself and be grateful like the Native Americans. As well, like the Native Americans, I thank the animal for their sacrifice. And I wonder, how do you know the animal would have picked you to feed off their corpse? So it's only a problem when white people are adopting these views? I don't think that's what she's saying, but I'm, I'm really not understanding her point here. Yes, she's right that it's a ridiculous worldview, but this is a worldview that's not stemming from from white people. White people are taking it on as just a way to excuse their bad behavior. I'm not sure how this how this supports the eating animals is inherently white supremacy and, and pro-patriarchy. I'm sure there will be comments saying, well, you go read this, go read this, but the, the onus is on her. She's the one giving this talk, which is pretty short. It's not even 13 minutes long. When you're going to say something like that, that is clearly very controversial and not something many people believe, you need to take a long time explaining why it is you believe that. Otherwise, it's a bad presentation. You're a bad speaker. I shouldn't have to go read all of your books to understand what you're saying in a 13-minute presentation. There's no room in the new colonialism for an indigenous worldview to exist. Instead, it collapses more than a hundred Native American nations into one amalgam and attributes a static indigenous worldview that erases those nations that were predominantly vegetarian and lived in urban areas. So I don't know how true that is, but I wouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, there is a reason that people are adopting this cosmocentric worldview you know, again, that the animal wants it actually wants you to kill them and you're doing a good thing and you respect all the things equally. There's a reason wealthy people out West are adopting that worldview as opposed to, you know, like what Jains believe or what some Buddhists believe regarding animals. You know, there, there's a, a very obvious reason for that. And it's that people want to excuse their bad behaviors. And it's a lot easier to do that when you say, this is my religion and it's a religion that's from this, you know, protected group, right? It makes it harder for people to criticize because people can feel like they're being really insensitive by criticizing it as opposed to just saying, 
no, I just don't value animals that much. And I, I really like eating animal products. 70% of the population would have to be eliminated for people to try to rely on hunting to survive. Who would live and who dies and who decides? Again, I think you can say this without uh, using kind of loaded words like colonial, <laughs> colonialism, almost making it a, a kind of insidious thing. I think you can talk about this without using those terms as I already did, as I just did in this video. And I did again, talking about the Earthling Ed video. You can just ask people, hey, why is it that you believe that? Where is your evidence that the moose or the elk or whatever um, understands that you're going to kill them and is accepting of it? Where is your evidence for that? And talking about animal consciousness and what we actually know about animals and what they can feel, you can do all of that without bringing in these loaded terms that ultimately I, I think add nothing to the conversation because it's the same whether a, a white person is doing this or a black person or an Asian, an Asian American person, like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who a woman, it doesn't matter who is doing this, who is advocating for these worldviews. The worldview itself is wrong, period. If you eat animals, you take up more climate space, requiring more water, more land, more forest deforestation, contributing more greenhouse gases. This is felt disproportionately by countries in the global south. Their carbon footprint is smaller, but they experience more frequent and intense climate change caused weather events. These events especially affect girls and young women. Your hamburger comes with a dose of misogyny. Okay, but misogyny, <laughs> it's based on intention. And I don't think the intention of people eating hamburgers is to be misogynist. I, I just don't agree with this use of these terms. I, I, I think intention matters. And again, you can talk about the effect that eating so much meat is having, the effect on the climate and the effect on poorer people globally, much poorer people, the effect it's having on them, not really on us, not yet anyway. You can talk about that without mentioning misogyny. You're just muddying the waters and pissing people off, confusing people, because I guarantee you people are listening to that. They're like, but that's not why I eat meat. I'm not misogynist. What? I'm a woman. <laughs> it was the colonizers, especially the British, who declared that the virility of meat eating nations explained their success over the supposed feminine and weak rice eating countries they defeated. Meat eaters often label us as soy boys and shit, which I love soy boy. I'm a soy boy. I'm a soy bitch. But I don't think the answer is to go the other way and to say, actually, if you're a true feminist, then you have to be vegan. I, I don't think that's the answer. Now you can show how they're similar, how the arguments for and against are similar, how people use the same sorts of excuses that they you know, for instance, used to condone slavery, subjugation of women. It's the same sorts of excuses they're using towards animals and, and uh, you know, excusing eating animal products. That's not the same thing as saying, oh, you're a feminist, but you eat meat. Well, you're not really a feminist. Feminist does not mean caring for female cows. It just doesn't. It means caring for female human beings. If you want to change the meaning of the word feminist, okay, fine, but you have to recognize that Virtually everyone else is not using that definition of the word. The assumption that the best protein comes from corpses is a racist belief, as it erases and replaces indigenous African, Asian, Mesoamerican cultural food practices. Again, I just don't agree that intent, intent doesn't matter. Intent matters. That's what makes racism an important term. I'm not saying systemic racism doesn't exist. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about those things. Again, particularly when it comes to redlining, when it comes to real estate and nimbyism. Although I think there's an argument to be made for leaving race out of it a lot of the times because improving zoning, removing single family zoning, making neighborhoods denser is going to benefit everyone, not just black people. And again, it's not helpful to tell people what she believes, which is what she's doing. She's saying, oh, you believe that animal protein is the best source of protein? Oh, that's because you're racist or your belief is stemming from racism. When I, I think a lot of 
people, particularly nutritionists and people who are well-versed in nutrition will say, no, I believe that animal protein is the best source of protein because it's a higher quality protein often. I mean, this is not really disputed by any experts in nutrition, including vegan experts in nutrition, in terms of bioavailability of protein. So it's just not useful. We can talk about the problems of eating meat. We can talk about the reasons why we should prefer plant protein, not just for animal welfare, not just for the environment, but also for our own health. We can talk about that without ever mentioning the word racism or sexism or colonialism. It's just so goofy to me and ultimately really unhelpful. Men in the West are taunted to renew their man card by eating meat because that's what real men do. That's the sexual politics of meat and it reveals how unsettled masculinity really is. Back home, my library card is good for seven years, but a man card can expire between breakfast and lunch if someone eats a veggie burger. Okay, that's pretty good. I like that. Again, I know I already said this, but yeah, it's really stupid and it's really pathetic in thinking that their masculinity is based on what they eat. I ultimately just feel bad for them. They have to be so concerned with what they eat for fear of coming across as not manly enough. What? <laughs> Being manly to me is being able to say, hey, I don't care. I don't give a fuck what society thinks. I'm not going to do this thing because it's wrong. Yeah, I'm going to live on beans and rice and vegetables. Eat a dick. That's manly to me. <laughs> There's a reason why the person I'm married to is like that. Instead of saying, oh man, I don't want people to think that I'm not manly enough. So I better eat this burger. That is so sad. But again, I don't think the answer is going to the opposite end of the spectrum where we accuse people of, of all of these things that they don't necessarily believe and we tie veganism to feminism and all these other isms. I, I don't think that's the answer either. I think we can say, no, veganism has nothing to do with any of that. It's literally just not exploiting animals because we don't have to. It, it's just harm reduction. That's it. There'd be no meat eating without the constant forced reproduction by female animals. Yet popular culture is flooded with references to sexy cows, sexy pigs, sexy chickens, sexy fishes who all just want to have fun. Okay, maybe I'm very naive. I, I don't watch like TV. I don't come across a lot of advertisements, so maybe I'm just not aware, but where are the sexy cows and sexy fish? I feel like there was a cartoon with like a fish walking on her fins and she had like lipstick on and something. I, am I crazy? But I think normally it's happy cows and happy animals. I don't think Tyson wants us to see cows as sexy. I think that's the furries, right? The only desire animals are credited with possessing is the desire to be consumed, which strangely can only be expressed after their death. Actually, I remember reading from a farmer who said that he could tell that their goats were like into it. They could just look into their eyes and they could tell the goats knew what was going to happen, that they were going to be slaughtered and that they were okay with it. Again, the things we tell ourselves because ultimately we are compassionate and we don't want to do these things. Some meat eaters are afraid of what they will feel if they look too closely at the degradations that constitute animals experience. Mention disabling practices or the devastating separation of cows and their babies. And we hear meat eaters exclaim, don't tell me. Why are they afraid of the feelings such knowledge produces? They accept a patriarchal construct that views feelings as unruly and untrustworthy, causing chaos. To say you care about animals is considered a sign of weakness in a world still committed to the gender binary that values stereotyped masculine reason over stereotyped feminine feeling and wants order. Women do the same thing. They say, no, don't tell me, I don't want to know. I assume she would say, well, that's because they've been brainwashed in this society, blah, 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 blah. They're part of the patriarchy too. But again, where, where is the evidence for that? Your vote tonight is important, but even more important is the question of what or who will be on your plate in the morning. 
sweet dreams. Yeah, I think she got madder and madder as it went on, people laughing at her, which I can't, you know, I can't blame her for being a little a little pissed off. But it, it's a shame because the, the ultimate message is just not helpful, bringing whiteness into it. And she had some good things to say. She had correct things to say about you know, using these these indigenous worldviews and, you know, respect the animal and how stupid that is and the effect that our diet has on the environment. And she had some good little pithy, you know, witty statements, comments in there. The new colonialist boasts, I only eat meat from locally owned farms and I know the farmers there love their animals. If killing what one loves is standard practice, I hope they don't start loving me. But it's all just buried under the colonialism feminist, racist stuff. And it's why I've never read her book, Sexual Politics of Meat, I think it's called. Um, yeah, I assumed it was a whole bunch of that stuff. And uh, yeah, not interested. Reading about ethics from someone like her to me is like reading a book about medicine from an anti-vaxxer or <laughs> physics from a flat earther. It's just not a good use of time. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. I would be interested in some of your thoughts. Sometimes I read comments. Usually I don't, but I'm sure other people will be chiming in. So feel free to uh, leave your two cents, particularly if you are more familiar with Carol Adams and have read her works and maybe can clarify a few things. Again, I don't think that makes the talk any better because you have to be able to explain these really controversial topics to people without you know, just saying, well, read my books. <laughs> but yeah, if you can clarify, uh, please do so. And if you liked it, give it a like. If you want to subscribe, that's cool. There's my stomach. I need to eat some food. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much to patrons at patreon.com slash unnatural vegan. Oh, I will watch the Michaela Peterson one probably next. I'm sure that one's full of uh, interesting information as well. Thanks again. New video soon.